Praise the Lord, tonight we are on a new series and uh, we're going to talk and cover the book of Genesis. Genesis has about 50 chapters and primarily divided into two sections. The first section is from chapter 1 to chapter 11 on creation and the four major events that changed the world. Then from chapter 12 onwards is the story of Abraham and um, up to chapter 50. Now, we're going to cover sometimes whole chapters together, uh, especially when we go into the life of Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. But uh, at the beginning part, <clears throat> as we begin uh, the first 11 chapters, we're going to cover, uh, especially creation, we're going to take a whole, a whole section in itself, even with a few verses. Because those few verses cover billions, if not in our time, billions of years. <clears throat> so we are going to cover and give a whole section to creation, which is what we introduce tonight. A very simple division of both Genesis when you study it is primarily divided into two sections. But uh, tonight we're going to look at <clears throat> creation, especially the creation of the universe and the world. And so let's look at the book of Genesis chapter 1. And you read that first. We will cover. <coughs> Let me see. Yes, primarily uh, chapter one was one to uh, one to three. With uh, part of three actually, but uh, we're gonna take a whole section for just these few verses, uh, and uh, that's because this uh, creation part is very important to the whole story of Genesis. Let's read in Genesis chapter 1, verse uh, 1 onwards. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. <clears throat> there is a time difference. We call that the creationist gap theory. There is a time gap between verse 1 and verse 2. So having read that, I'm going to draw <coughs> little diagrams. <coughs> Let's see where we are in our diagrams. Okay. <coughs> Let's get a fresh new one. And um, let me check uh, the color black. Okay. So here's uh, Genesis uh, chapter 1. Then... Uh, there is chapter, chapter 1 verse 2. So this is Genesis, uh, Genesis uh, 1 verse 1 and then Genesis uh, 1 verse 2. Between them we call that the gap. We can call that <coughs> the first creation. So this is the creation of the universe. This is called the re-creation. And the, the reason is in between verse 1 and verse 2 is where we fit Satan's rebellion. Now let's see how to do that. Okay. So that is the Satanic rebellion. And everything has verses. Satanic rebellion you find in uh, Isaiah 14, Isaiah 14, and uh, you also find Ezekiel 28. These are the places where we had to fit in Satan's rebellion. <coughs> Let's look at uh, the Bible from uh, Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah chapter 14. And then after that, we explain why we adhere to the gap theory, gap theory of creation. creation. 
The funny thing about prophecies in the book of Isaiah and the book of Ezekiel 28 is that sometimes a prophet is prophesying, prophesying on a normal early event and on the early countries. Then suddenly he goes off on tangent into some spiritual dimension that is not of this earth. Uh, and that is happening here, which is why you find it suddenly uh, talking about uh, Babylon. And then all of a sudden, in verse 12 onwards, you have these verses. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the further side of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet, you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you and consider you, saying, Is this the man who make the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who make the world as a wilderness and destroy its cities, who did not open a house of his prisoners, etc. So this is a sudden verse that talks about the fall of Satan that we know uh, in the book of Revelations in chapter 12 when it spoke about Michael the archangel pushing down Satan to the earth from the atmosphere above the earth he pushed Satan down to the earth and then there were descriptions about how that this was the dragon that is Lucifer uh, the dragon and uh, with his tail he swiped uh, one third of the stars down and the stars in the book of Revelation chapter 12 which we have already covered the book of Revelations remember we touched on the book of Revelations and then uh, we had a little short series on ex prosperity for the Exodus now we are back to Bible study on the book of Genesis and uh, that uh, it is only in the book of Revelations that it mentioned one third of the fallen angels one third of the angels fell with him. It's almost like one third of the universe at that time fell when Satan fell. The, the measurement or the number was given only in the book of Revelation chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 14 and uh, Ezekiel 28 did not mention the proportion. But it did mention how Satan first fell. Now, also the book of Ezekiel chapter 28 Ezekiel chapter 28 and this time he talked about King Atar who was behaving like a satanic way uh, then suddenly <coughs> suddenly in verse uh, 11 and 12 onwards he began to talk about something not of the earth and he talked about Satan which uh, we read the second part of verse 12. Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. <clears throat> you were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, barrel, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pies was prepared for you on the day you were created. So it's a created being. You were the anointed cherub. Definitely cannot be referring to humans. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I establish you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways on the day you were created. Till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God and I destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings. And uh, 
again mentioned about the trading that he was doing and the multitude of his iniquities. Now, let's look at our little diagram. Here we are in our little diagram. The reason why we put it between verse 1 and verse 2 is, as you saw in my reading, from verse 3 onwards, uh, there was a recreation of the planet Earth. Uh, and there was a first day, the countdown began. First day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, and God made man. Uh, and uh, then the seventh day, God rested. And we know that there is no other place to fit in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. Because in the Garden of Eden, suddenly out of the blue, you have the serpent and Satan. Which imply that he must have fell before the first day. Because those are continuous days. And everything was perfect. So he fell before the first day. And that first day, second day, etc. All have to do with recreation here. That somewhere here in the original creation, between here and here, there was called the gap. And you know the Bible... Uh, sometime between one verse and another verse can be a long period. If you remember, uh, Jesus read from Isaiah chapter 61 when he was in uh, his hometown in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. And he stopped in the middle of a sentence. Because the other part of Isaiah 61 was going to be fulfilled in his second coming. And that actually broke even a sentence into two. Interesting that the Bible uh, sometimes is that way. And we know it's nearly 2,000 years since the reading of Jesus, Isaiah chapter 61. The first part about his first coming, the second part about his second coming. And so sometimes gaps are like that in the Bible. We also know that there was a gap in Acts chapter 9 on Paul's life between verse 25 and 26. Because uh, Paul mentioned in Galatians chapter 1, that, uh, chapter 1, that he was three years in Arabia and Damascus. And there's no way you could fit in his three years. Because in Acts chapter 9, verse 26, Paul went uh, to Jerusalem, and then Barnabas introduced him to the apostles. And Paul in Galatians chapter 1 says that for three years, he was in Arabia and then in Damascus, and he never met the apostles. So sometimes when you go to fit the Bible verses together, there is only one place you can fit in. And that's why uh, in Acts chapter 9, verse 25, 26, the little verse has a gap of three years. But here, verse 1 to verse 2 has a gap of millions of years. The Bible sometimes just passes over things that the, the Bible doesn't want to talk about. So, this is where Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28 took place, somewhere between here to here, that the earth fell. The earth was changed. Now, the earth was only part of one third of the universe. And uh, so, it was like uh, when the universe fell, it was at a certain state. God was still doing a lot of things. Then when it fell, about one third of it fell. Not exactly in a straight line. But God began to put a boundary between that which fell and that which did not fall. So you end up with the angels in the universe being divided into three groups. The pristine universe which never fell, the boundary angels, and the warfare angels that were commissioned by God to sort of uh, this dethrone and, and, uh, and remove uh, the powers and authorities of all the fallen angels. So you end up with these three grouping of angels that were reorganized. Now, since the fall of uh, Satan, the universe continued to grow on the pristine side. So it continued to grow. And uh, compared to the universe when it first fell, the pristine side is not very large. And the fallen side, we live in the fallen side of the universe. And in the fallen side of the universe, it was, is, is now less than one third because the pristine universe had grown. But here we are in the fallen section of the universe. And this is called the gap theory. And uh, because 
if you look at uh, there are several uh, supports for the for this uh, theory and uh, we look at the book of Genesis chapter 1 again oops it takes a long time uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to verse 2 you notice in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth then suddenly in verse 2 the earth was without form and void and these are words that I love to disturb you all with remember without form is tohu and then void is bohu tohu bohu juha right and uh, so tohu bohu so suddenly in verse 2 the earth was tohu bohu when you compare that to Isaiah chapter 45 verse 18 look at Isaiah chapter 45 verse 18 1 eight. It says, For thus says the Lord, Who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth. The word form, by the way, is a word that we have learned. is the word form or yet, sir. So, God formed through his mind and through his energy, who f through his uh, uh, visualization. Who formed the earth and made, and made it, who has established it, and here's the verse, who did not create it in vain. Who did not create it to who. So when God first made the, the earth and the heavens, it was all filled with life. It became tohu bohu. It was not made that way. And that harmonizes with the scripture in uh, Genesis chapter uh, 1 verse 2 it says the earth was but uh, in various translation you can see the word was is the word haya in the Hebrew the word haya means it came to be it came to be it became so in some translations, like the Young's Little translation, uh, and some other uh, translators try to bring out the Hebrew, it's, it didn't say the earth was. It says the earth became tohu bohu. It didn't explain how it became until Isaiah 14 came and Ezekiel 28 came. It explained how it became. There was a satanic rebellion. You could imagine before the rebellion so we go back to our little chat here before the rebellion after everything was created everything was perfect every single planet in the universe every solar system every galaxy was perfect and it exists in that perfection for a long long time and uh, when I look at it in visions because the Bible never gives a time estimate. And remember, the earth was already in existence here. The earth, which is a tiny part of the universe. And it was in existence there. And everything was perfect that was there. And when I look at it in vision, trying to give a time estimation, uh, approximately kind of uh, in, the, in the perfect time, it was roughly like a billion years. And uh, then the period here to here, I estimate my personal estimation, not no no doctrine, just personal estimation, about a million of the perfect years before was to come about in recreation. However, time has changed because long ago, one day is like a thousand years of our time uh, in its perfect stage. But uh, now, one year is very, very, very short. It's based on the rotation, the imperfect rotation around our present sun. Everything is in a fallen state. And so, when you multiply things by a thousand, then you realize, if this was a perfect one billion, this was a perfect one million, you add a thousand to it, then you know a thousand million is a billion. And, uh, a yeah, it's a billion. 
and a thousand billion is a trillion. So it's talking about billions of years in our measurement of time. So the gap theory I've given to you from Genesis chapter 1, uh, uh, verse 1 to verse 2, and to show forth, uh, firstly, it's a logical place to put Isaiah 28 and uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. It is also the logical place to bring about Isaiah 45 verse 18 to show how it became Tohu Bohu. Plus, scientifically, it gives support to the fact that in our discovery of science, that the earth is more than 6,000 years. Because when you measure from Adam's time to our time, do you know that in the Jewish time, the Jewish calendar is based from the day of Adam's creation? Somehow their measurement means a lot, and it's only 5,000 something. But in uh, a lot of the various other dispensationalist measurement of time, you get just have to count the ages and fill in a few gaps. Uh, there are only very few gaps where the time was not given. So you trace the ages of who was born, who was born, who was born where, and you trace back, somebody did a tracing back, it's roughly about 6,000 years only. And, and we know the earth is older than that. Uh, in the fossils and in all the things when they go deep, deeper and deeper, the earth did exist for billions of years. But our present dispensation, our modern era, since what I call the Adamic creation, existed only about roughly about 6,000 odd years. And uh, even though they measure all the different things, remember that uh, some of the things are based on carbon-14, which uh, uh, presuppose that the amount of carbon-14 is the same. But carbon-14 has changed in, uh, in its quantity. So that would have affected the measurement also. But more or less, uh, it gives another uh, harmony to science where the earth is measured to be billions of years old when measured by uh, various methods of uh, physics and uh, various archaeological research and everything. So there is this gap theory of creation that is there. This is a simple thing and up to here we have touched on the area and cover uh, this area. Uh, an interesting point, not important, if we forget it, doesn't matter. Uh, this is just additional things that saw in visions that the original earth, uh, the original, although this whole thing is creation, let's say the earth is one dot, the original earth all had actually got three moons. Three moons. Somewhere between here to here, uh, because Satan used the earth as his headquarters. Why? Wow, you don't know, like this planet was a HQ of the enemy. And uh, then after the Satan was uh, judged uh, way back before Adam's creation, then uh, before Adam came into being, left only one moon. Left only one moon. The other two moons were destroyed during the judgment of Satan, during his fall. And uh, so that's not, not important, but in case you're curious about some of these things and what uh, uh, visions uh, are, are seen there. But uh, uh, there's this, that is why we call it this big giant gap that is there. But when the true more verses into here to describe more things that happen here before I describe what happened here. And uh, during this time of satanic judgment, so there was a time when he was functioning okay and then he started rebelling. During this time of uh, satanic rebellion uh, that is going on, uh, that is there, when God judged the section of the universe, and uh, I got to draw a side little thing. I don't want to go to another chart. Just draw it at the side here. Pretend that this section is the universe, and okay, that thing disappeared, okay, and um, then one third of it fell, not in a straight line, but uh, one third of it fell, one third of it fell, uh, and that is this section here. When that section, one third fell, and when the judgment of God was done, not exactly a straight line, but just for easy illustration. When God make a judgment on the enemy, 
Okay, I use a black line now. This whole section was cordoned off. And then God thought in his judgment, God removed all of his life from that section. And his life is like his light. God removed it. The moment God removed it, every single star, every single uh, solar system and star system, the sun went shoo, dead. Yes, the nuclear reaction, as you know, fusion, the burning of... But it's more, it's hydrogen fusion. Uh, in case you don't know about uh, this area of astronomy, do you know that, we all know that in the stars, is a fusion reactor. And at first it starts with the fusion of hydrogen and then it, cre it creates helium. But as the hydrogen is used up, it began to have the fusion of lower and lower, uh, uh, heavier and heavier metals. That's why it goes to different stages of the stars until it reaches a stage where it's a fusion of very heavy metals and it explodes and it becomes a supernova. Where you cannot fuse things anymore. Uh, in its, a star life in its natural state that fusion reactor that was going on in every star stopped it was really dark in that uh, cordon of area when, when the judgment came about and Satan and his fallen angels were left in the dark for millions and millions of, year, of our years and nothing was happening for some time. While well, God was still working on this section. There are angels who are here still watching our work. They are what we call the warring angels. Then there are angels that are watching the boundary because the boundary is not a straight line. And so some worlds are fallen, then the next world might not be fallen. So the angels, they create the boundaries all over. And so then there are boundary angels. And then there are the pristine angels. They are there. So God continued to do things here and something interesting was taking place. And that was Satan's rebellion lasted about a million odd perfect years. In our time, it could, could be a billion odd years. And, uh, and it looks like he was free roaming about for some time before the judgment. And he was trying to win the other rest of the, of the angels. And in visions, and this is a vision seen by the first seven thunders uh, prophet. So it's not just uh, one person, but also uh, his one testimony and, and, and my testimony on that vision. That, uh, and it was our angel Uriel who took uh, to show that section. And he showed the last part of the rebellion. How Satan already got wanted of fallen angels, spirit beings, and inhabitants. They were inhabitants on various planets. Inhabitants on various planets that have fallen along with the fallen angels, spirit beings, and everything. But none of the big, gigantic uh, spirit beings uh, uh, have fell at all. But there were some fallen angels, some fallen angels, some spirit beings, and inhabitants of some of the worlds that were there. And he was trying to persuade the rest of the two-thirds to believe in him. And so, so we were only shown this scenario. Uh, and in the scenario, in the vision, it was like the age of the universe. The universe has an age. And the age of the universe looked like a very cloudy form. Beyond that, there is nothing. Nothing exists. So it looks like, you know, like, let's say this is a universe. There is an age. Today we never see the age of the universe because we don't have the technology to even go travel that far. Do you know that to go to Mars and come back uh, will take us nearly two years? So it's a long journey on our basic rocket ship. Uh, so, it's, so we don't have the technology, nor the means to travel very far in space. Uh, and uh, we cannot even travel at a quarter or light speed. Uh, and uh, so all those movies that 
walk travel and all those things, those are only movies. And uh, according to Einstein theory, actually it's impossible to travel faster than the speed of light. Although there is a sub-branch of quantum theory that believe it's possible through a quantum wormhole. But uh, 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 ignoring science for the moment, that there is an age of the universe. And so all we saw in the vision was like it's taken to one age of the universe uh, in a fallen world. And there, Satan was going to demonstrate that he was God. So with all the fallen angels at the boundary, he commanded some of his fallen angels to go outside the universe. That means to go outside that universe. Shoom. To create. Now within this universe, the angels and the spirit beings have been involved in a creative process. They were like using the energy of God and God used them for the, the angels in charge of plants, uh, different things and forces and all that. So God has been using them. Remember, we are talking about before human beings show up on earth. Uh, we all were like spirit beings somewhere in God. And some of us were kept away from all these. Some of us, you know, had some visibility of that. And uh, so, Satan sent a team of fallen angels out to create. And when they went out, they just ceased to exist. At that point, the whole universe... Now remember that, that in the universe, it could be here, 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 and whatever is done is visible to all of them. There is no limitation of sight in the universe. All things are known. And at that moment where he sent out and, and then all of them disappeared, everyone knew he is just a created being. And then all of them were stripped of their power. They were judged. And that was when all their powers were removed, taken away. And they were left in this dark void for some time. In this dark void. For a long, long time. No star shine. There is no light. Don't talk about even physical light. Not one bit. It was darker than darkness itself because there was no life there and what happened here in recreation was this when it was in the fullness of time for the Adamic race to come forth but before that there was one little side story at the very moment when Satan in his heart started to rebel Something was happening. You remember in the throne room of God, there are seven spirits. You remember the book of Revelation, the seven spirits of God? The seven spirits started to come down to the universe. So let's assume, for example, and uh, let me use a different color. Bright red, yes, I remember. Let's assume they are here at the throne room. So they started coming down the layer by layer of heaven from seven heaven, six, now seven heaven, six, five, four, three, two, and then come down to one here. So they started their descent. So Satan thought nothing was happening, but he didn't know God was planning something. Remember, Christ and what God wanted to reveal was hidden from the ages. Ages plural. From even the age of the angels. And what we knew was when we met the seven angels of the seven churches, at first they looked like angels. And we assumed they were angels assigned to churches like angels are assigned to churches today. But then when the Lord began to show that they are not ordinary angels, 
they are in a shape and form of angels but they're actually the seven spirits of God now when the seven spirits started descending down because the seven spirits represent the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is also God so being God the Holy Spirit can manifest himself in seven spirits one correct Jesus is in your heart Jesus is in my heart how many Christians today are born again let's say on the planet earth let's assume there are one billion people born again how is it that Jesus split himself into one billion little parts and come into our heart because he's God God can be in more than one place at the same time God's omnipresent omnipotence and omniscient that's the three omnis of God remember one of the omnis omnipresent so what happened is the Holy Spirit chose to reveal himself in his seven spirits so the seven spirits of God started descending but because Holy Spirit is also God when they descend a part of them was still there but they sent some sort of their manifest presence coming down and Satan during his time of of a heyday rebellion he thought nothing was happening he didn't realize that God was already coming down it took a long long time until in the Adamic time they reach the third heaven by the time they reached the third heaven they began to take shape and form and they began to look like the seven angels of the seven churches which were later on assigned to the seven churches because they prophetically point to the end time and they point to the generation that see Jesus Christ come again where we merge with them and the seven spirits which represent as you all remember they are Ephesus Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea representing the spirit of peace, spirit of love, spirit of uh, glory, spirit of power, spirit of uh, life, spirit of wisdom, spirit of mercy so we understood that they are these spirits manifest and when were the seven, seven churches founded? When Paul was in Ephesus for three years. When he went there. Remember Ephesus is, a, is the first of those churches. When Paul started the church in Ephesus, the seven an angels of the seven churches told Paul to start the other churches, the other six. And when Paul started them, and then he, he made a, a tour and came back to Ephesus, all the angels were waiting there for the end time prophecy due in the year 2012 our modern day AD 2012 when the first seven thunders prophets at that time he didn't know all these end time thing either he was just visiting the seven churches before he go as a missionary to the Middle East and we were wanting to support him as a missionary to the Middle East at that time so during the time that he was there when he reached there the angels started giving instruction you must take you must follow the order of revelation chapter 2 and 3 and then uh, it happened to be a 40 day fast that on the 40th day of the fast he was in the pergamos and on february the 9th and it was there that the lord revealed this end time move and then from that trip onwards all the seven angels of the seven churches followed him back to COG Singapore and then they are joined now with the COG Archangel wherever the COG Archangel is the seven angels of the seven churches are tag along following and they're watching over this end time move as you know from 2012 uh, of to now uh, the angel of Ephesus had at one time ministered to the people same with the angel of Smyrna and then I met with the angel of Pergamos uh, when I was there in Australia 
uh, after Uda Luza, uh, all this, they, they were line giving messages, and each one of them, we have met, each, one, each one impart different things. So they represent the seven spirits of God. So there was this uh, descending that took, that took a long, long time. Why? Because the glory of God is so great that if they descend too fast, the universe will collapse. So they had to slow down the process so you can manage how much energy they represent. There are still the seven spirits at the throne room. But we have a manifestation of the seven spirits in the seven angel. Let's call them a manifestation of the seven spirits. And the reason they come to our level is to bring us up to their level. By merging with them, they can draw us back to their level. So all these things were happening. And remember, this whole part was all darkness. And then God decided to recreate. That was when Genesis chapter 1 verse 3 began. And then God spoke and said, Let there be light. Boom. The light and the life of God came back to the fallen universe. For the first time, the wanted fallen universe saw the light of God. And remember, I'd like to show you that the whole universe was not lighted up yet until the earth. And God finished the earth first. At least a few parts. And he makes sure that the earth had a land mass before he brought forth in verse 11. Uh, there was a first day was the light. And uh, God said, let there be light. Now, in verse 4, the light and the darkness was not the normal light and darkness. It is not sunlight and evening. Because the sun hasn't started shining yet. The sun only shone later. So there was no normal 24-hour solar day that we know. So what is this light in darkness? The light was places where God was recreating. And then it pushed Satan and his fallen angels and fallen spirit into another depth of darkness. Most of them are hidden inside planets. Because the light of God was shining everywhere. Like on the earth, he was pushed below the surface. And so they were pushed further in and into areas what we call Sheol. Sheol or Hades is located in the center of the earth. Jesus did talk about uh, the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And uh, it's right in the heart of the earth. And of course, now, physically, in the heart of the earth is like a burning, very uh, burning hot mass, uh, molten thing. But you're only looking physically. There's another dimension of it, which is considered Hades, or hell, as we, in, as we translate the word Hades. There is, they were pushed lower. So God separated the light where he was recreating from the dark parts that were prisons or places that were uh, satanic fallen angels and spirit beings will push further down. So God made a line between them. The light and the darkness. That was a light and darkness that was in day one. And then, that was the first day. Then second day, verse 6. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And that was when God separated the land from the waters because it, otherwise it's a watery planet. Now, if the land of the planet Earth was made smooth the whole earth will be covered by water the only reason you have continents and land mass is because the 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 land mass is all uh twisted and turned and some parts jut out of the water and god made one land mass so originally the earth only got one continent that we call it pangea before it broke into the five to seven continents that we know today. And you look at the shape of the continents, you can see it could almost fit it, fit it back together like a jigsaw puzzle. Indeed, the earth was at one point one piece called Pangea, before it broke into the various continents. 
And that was a firmament that is seen on the second day. Then, we see on the third day, uh, oh, the, on the second day, the land hasn't appeared. God separated two parts of the water. Then on the third day, the dry land appeared. Then when the dry land appeared, God didn't leave the dry land. The dry land, God commanded to have plants and trees. And that was the third day. They started bearing fruit. And remember, the sun hasn't even been recreated yet. Because we saw uh, the morning and night, there was a third day. Look at verse 13. Third day, three days. So all the plant life existed based on God's life. In verse 14, and we know that's possible because in New Jerusalem, it says they don't need any sunlight. The Lamb of God was the light. And uh, so in verse 14, in the fourth day, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and seasons, for days and years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. It was so God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So there you go. The stars, the sun started shining fourth day. Now since the stars only started shining on the fourth day, the assumption was it was not shining before that. Since the sun only started burning all over again with a fusion reactor on the fourth day, it assumed that it, the fusion reaction also stopped. So God actually recreated all the fusion in the stars. And then, of course, the moon would reflect the light. And all that is there. Fourth day. Now, if you read very carefully and you don't miss any verses, the fact that he mentions stars imply, oops, uh, my diagram again, imply that the whole section here was in darkness. Because stars, no matter how far, are still like our sun. It's just a burning, uh, a burning fusion reactor out there. And all of them only started shining on the fourth day. So that was the detailed recreation of this part. That is there. Which, which, uh, uh, okay, next week, we, I'm in Australia, which in two weeks' time, we'll talk more on this part of recreation and Adam and Eve. But uh, we focus on this part, recreation, and how this part leads to this part. Now I'm going to look at this original part here. Right? I'll talk about the gap here, what's happening here to the recreation. But let me talk about this creation here. Because there are many verses that involve this creation that we want to put together. Not just Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. You need John chapter 1, verse 1, to 1 and 2. So let's bring John chapter 1 into. And uh, let me read all the verses here. There is a creation that mentioned in John chapter uh, 1, verse 1 and 2. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Now here's the thing. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And through him all things were made. Let's look at our diagram. We started here. We started here. Creation. Now, even though there was no one counting the clock, the calendar and everything, the first time this universe existed, the first time it existed is a beginning. Because when you use words like a beginning, there is also an end. So what happened is this. Uh, let me draw a parallel thing here in red. Okay. Pretend this is the God ram. 
This is God. God ram. There is no beginning. How dare you say God got a beginning? Right? If you ever apply the word beginning to God, you're saying that God has a beginning. God created time. Time is a creation in Him. God is bigger than time. He made and created time and the concept of time. So, even God has no beginning, no end. He exists in what I call the God dimension. That's that God dimension. The God dimension has no boundaries. In fact, if I were to, I draw a little bit of that. But this is the real, uh, let me draw a little bit. There is no limit to God. Now, this is only like a little bit, a square part that shows the dimension of God. So, everything is God. So, there's God, God, everything is God. There's no God, there's God, everything is God. He exists. And, God created the universe. So, the universe how big it is exists in a tiny little part of God. God is bigger than the universe. There's no size that you can apply to God. That is a proportion you have to think about God. So even though my other chart hey, stuck, okay, shows a little bit because of we are living in the universe looking at God. So we only see a glimpse of the dimension of God. But remember, that dimension of God is bigger than the universe. <laughs> so God exists in the God dimension. And when there was a beginning, when creation first started, John chapter 1 was 1 took place, God came out and existed here and time was not measured so there is God and this is called the part of God called the Word which John captured that part and said in the beginning there is the beginning of the universe was the Word. And he's correct. The Word exists. He came into the created universe. He exists. And the Word was with God. And the Word is God. Except in the created dimension to create us. And it says the Word is God. There is God. And it looks like if you view the God dimension and the creator dimension, you could see like they look like two gods. But actually it's God in two dimensions. The God in the God dimension and the word which was God in a creator dimension. It's just like if I take uh, if, if uh, uh, another Johan takes a time machine from uh, now in 2017, from 2027, and travel back in time to tonight, he will stand there, he's a Johan from 2027, I'm the Johan from 2017, you see two of me. Because he came from the future into our time dimension. So you will see two. But he actually doesn't exist here. It's just for visibility in a time machine. And but he actually exists in the other time. So, sometimes you can see the two, which is what John chapter 1 tells us. In the beginning, in the beginning, there was the Word. And the Word was God, and the Word was... He used the word 
with God. Because from a certain perspective, there was God in two dimensions. In a created dimension called the Word, in an uncreated called the God dimension. And then it was the Word who was God that created all things. So John went further back than Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. John went to Genesis chapter 1 verse 0. So John chapter 1 verse 1 is before Genesis 1 1. Because he went backwards in time further back. So that adds John chapter 1 verse 1, the creation. But there's another creation that I'll look at. There is, uh, look at another verse, Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. In Proverbs chapter 8, <clears throat> um, yeah, we have chapter 8, particularly verse 30. And this is called wisdom. Wisdom. And you look at the whole chapter, it's a whole chapter about wisdom. And it actually calls... Uh, Wisdom was called as even in a feminine tense. It says in verse chapter 8, verse 1 Does not wisdom cry out? And understanding lift up her voice. She takes a stand on the top of the hill beside the way where the paths meet. She cries. So this feminine wisdom. And um, then it goes on to tell about everything about what wisdom is. And then it says, Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I'm understanding, I have strength. Verse 15. By me, kings reign. Rulers decree justice. By me, princes rule. Nobles and the judges of the earth. And then it continues. Verse 22. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. Before his works of old. And there is the Holy Spirit manifesting as wisdom. And from the beginning, in verse 23, before, do you notice in verse 23? Before there was ever an earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. So wisdom existed way back. Now, here when he talk about wisdom in a feminine sense, let me read more verses before I ask a question. Verse 26. While as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the primal dust of the world. <laughs> Let's really go backwards in time. Remember, the earth and all the universe was created in one spoken word. Big Bang, if you want to call it. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep. And then verse 30. Then I was beside him as a master craftsman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. All nice verses, eh? Remember, chapter 8 talks about the creation. Before the earth even exists. Before the foundation of the earth. And I'd like to ask one question. Is Proverbs 8 talking about a created being or an uncreated being, Holy Spirit? Well, you can look through up and down and answer that question for me. Is Proverbs 8 talking about created being or part of the Holy Spirit uncreated being wisdom what well, tough question eh? <laughs> okay ding 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 phone your thinking gap smile like Part of the Holy Spirit. 
Okay. So, looking very carefully, when it says here in verse 25, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. Was that the Holy Spirit being brought forth? Or was that spirit of wisdom being brought forth? So are you saying that is now if it's a Holy Spirit, you say it's a small part of the Holy Spirit. According to Isaiah eleven, there will be seven understanding. Okay. Now, is there a masculine spirit of wisdom? And that is in Christ Jesus, right? Because Jesus is the spirit of wisdom too. And then, remember that the Holy Spirit can be the spirit of wisdom. And Revelation in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, 19. Moses in Deuteronomy 34 laid hands on Joshua. And the spirit of wisdom came upon Joshua. So there was manifestation of the spirit of wisdom. Then there is a feminine spirit of wisdom. Why feminine? Why masculine? Jesus masculine side. And then we ask a question. Was this the Holy Spirit or created being? And here's the thing. In the book of Job, chapter 38. Let me bring more scriptures. Job chapter 38. It has a very interesting little verse that talks about the creation of the earth too. And that's why we are bringing all these things together. In Job chapter 38, let me grab to the verses for you. Here it is. Let me see which part to start. Okay. Okay. The Lord spoke to Job and said, Prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Verse 4. Job 38 verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Remember, when he first created the earth. Say, where were you? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determines its measurement? Surely you know. Or who stretched a line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid his cornerstone? And here's an interesting part, verse 7. When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy, when he laid the foundation of the earth and creation. Here's the thing. We know that sons of God, in chapter 38, refer to the same sons of God in chapter 1 of Job. And chapter 2 of Job, which was inclusive of our angels and angels. Which ties to Genesis 6, sons of God came into the daughters of men, that one referred to fallen angels. Once upon a time, sons of God. So the generic title, sons of God, referred to angelic beings. It also is a reference to Adam when he was created. Because he says, and Adam, the son of God. And that's in the, in the uh, gospel story. He envied Adam. And Adam, the son of God. So Adam was also a son of God. When he was originally created. You, you remember, remember all these verses? Right, I better uh, give to you. Uh, from the gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke. And uh, all the places where the names are given, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, verse 38. Luke chapter 3, verse 38. The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. <laughs> Implied. Of God. So, there we have, and we ask this question, in this creation here, 
A lot of things will happen before the foundation, before the universe, which includes the earth. The earth is only one dot here. There were beings who exist. And here's the thing. It says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and that one talk about us. So let's read that verse since talking about us. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Verse 4. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Again, talking about way back, before the foundation of the world. The conclusion it implies is this. From chapter 38 of Job, from Ephesians chapter 1, before God made the material universe, the stars, the planets, and, uh, and uh, all the places for creatures to inhabit and live on, so that you could call the planet Earth your home planet or whatever it was. Before God made all the planets and the physical material universe, which was spiritual too, but a material substance, God made spirit beings first. We are spirit beings. Angels are spirit beings. Angels are called ministering spirits. Are not all angels spirits? It says in Hebrews chapter 1. And before the foundation of the world, we exist in God. There are two ways you can look at the existence. You could exist just in the mind of God, which is what some people think. Or you could actually exist. And so some of you say, if I exist, how can I don't remember? Because when you came to the earth, the memory was taken. You were not allowed to keep those memories. Because it will hinder your progress on earth. What you do. And here's the thing. Jesus was not like us, but he came as a man. But he came into a created body. Correct? His body was created in a womb by God himself. So he, uncreated, came into the created body. Do you think Jesus was allowed to retain all his memories? Jesus had to learn how the language. He had to learn Hebrew. He had to rediscover who he is. Then it's fair. Because if you retain your memory, from baby you really can speak all the heavenly tongue. What? No need anyone to teach you. From baby you really you can describe drawings and, and, and do everything. For the moment your hands can move, you can play piano and everything. Because if you play organs, a piano, a musical instrument, if you retain everything. One of the things we forgot was that Jesus also started like us. He has, he has a clean slate and had to rediscover everything. Just like you and I. But Jesus did pre-exist. He says, before Abraham was, I am. That means he discovered his pre-existence. In our scientific language, we call he united back with with his OS, original self. This self was avatar self. This this planet is just a temporary place. Now, having thrown all this out before you to show that before God made the material universe, He breathed out spirit being. See, spirit beings take a different type of creation. It is God imparting His life out. 
And that life was individualized into individual little existence. God breathed out life. And spirit beings came about. Angels came about. Angels came about. Future Adamic race beings came about. All of us came about. And we were chosen. All was, all was seeded by God. Chosen for different things. And then, then, in a short while, then God created all the rest of the universe. Why do I bring that fact up? Because I want to point to the fact that they are existing. You see, if the sons of God rejoice when God was planting the foundation of the earth, they are existing. They exist before the foundation of the earth. And we exist before the foundation of the earth also. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Whether we were there watching or somewhere training, wherever we were, we were somewhere in God. And the fact is, there were a lot of spirit beings existing. We were all perfect. They were beings created for worship, beings created for wisdom, beings created for power, beings created for knowledge, beings created for everything that is there. And we exist as pure beings in God. Remember, no fallen, no fall yet for some time. And uh, so, uh, let me go back to the diagram. Here we are. So, we exist in this beautiful creation before the fall. All existing. And then God was creating the worlds and everything. And I know some of the archangels specialize in worlds. Like uh, the archangel of uh, COG. Uh, he specialized in creating civilizations on planets. So all different type of uh, uh, skills that they were given. So uh, when planets were created, then spirit beings go to the planet and then there's a creation of civilization there. So there were a lot of spirits. Some spirits are created for that galaxy and then they will go and populate that galaxy, that galaxy. The last of the last of the last reserve for this section. Planet Earth. And here we are on planet Earth. And then on planet Earth, we are given a Bible which, which gives us clues to what was existing before us. And then we come down to this fact about Proverbs chapter 8. Was that the Holy Spirit or was that a created being? Again, I bring you to that question which what does it mean in Proverbs chapter 8 if it was part of the Holy Spirit by verses like uh, I came forth and um, then he says by verses like uh, the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way Verse 23, I have been established from everlasting. From the beginning, before there was an earth, I was brought forth. And then, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. I was beside him as a master craftsman. It does look like the Holy Spirit, correct? But the question is, why feminine? And I have a little chart for you. So that brings to my chart. Remember I talked about the seven spirits? And I taught a series called Seven Spirit Square. And now I fill out all the squares. So this is only done this year. So I can tell you, I've been busy studying the Bible. Uh, can we do it in such a way that this whole thing up a bit, just, just from this part onward? Anyway, so you can see the bottom also, all the seven spirits. Uh, okay. That's as good as it gets, eh? Okay.
Okay. Okay, let's just get as good as it gets. Seven spirits. Wisdom. Uh, now, I did not put uh, peace first. I put wisdom as a preeminence because of this teaching on creation. Remember, before anything came forth, wisdom was there first. So, although wisdom is actually number six in the seven churches, but I put it as preeminent wisdom. Then you have peace, uh, love, glory, power, life, and actually wisdom, then mercy. So I put wisdom here and mercy here. Now, wisdom times wisdom is the square. Peace times peace, love squared, love times love is here. So the purple line is where the square is. And I remember I taught a series on that. And it all points to Jesus in a series. In a way, it does point to Jesus. And I thought about when you have wisdom squared, because you need the square to produce creation. I wisdom times wisdom. So I put this pink color, blue color, feminine, masculine. So in all the seven spirits, they are part of the Holy Spirit. There's a feminine aspect and a masculine aspect. You need that for creation. Now by masculine and feminine, I'm not talking about gender. I'm talking about dimensions. Because there are angels that are feminine looking angels. I remember that under Ragu Ra'el, Ragu, there are two angels in Australia. One is Uriah Luzael, who was originally over the planet, but now known as the Archangel of Australia, and he's in Ayers Rock. The other is Ragu Ra'el. And Ragu Ra'el only went in when Smith Wigglesworth visited Australia. That was when he went in, and he became the second Archangel over Australia, uh, especially preparing Australia for the end time. Ragu Ra'el. He is based from the northern parts of Canberra. Uh, and that's where his base is. Uh, now, Ragu Ra'el was the one who transported us 100 kilometers to where he was when we were on the way to Canberra. If he didn't transport us, we would never visit the place where he was because we were looking for other places. But he just transported us to where he was. And Ragu Ra'el has many angels under them. Some of the archangels got many angels under them. One of the angels under Ragi Ra'el is Estatiriel. Estatiriel. Estatiriel looks like a feminine looking angel. But they don't have gender like the human race. They do not have genitals or sexual definition between the legs. Nothing. And they are just having the attributes that are there. So what I want to show forth is that, which, uh, which is not taught before, that at the very beginning, when God created all things, He needed the masculine and the feminine. Remember that, according to Hebrew, uh, Hebrew chapter 11, verse 3, that, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that the things that are uh, visible were made of things that are invisible. And also in Romans chapter 1, it tells us that God shows his attributes by the things that are created. We humans are very well aware that we, are, we have male and female. This is a type of Showing forth that something else exists beyond male and female. Inside the spiritual realm. That there is a feminine aspect and a masculine aspect. That brought forth the creation. And that explains why in Romans chapter 8. Uh, not Romans chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. When God was creating this world. You saw it in John chapter 1 verse 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. 
That means everything was made by Jesus, which is, quote unquote, the masculine aspect. But then you have Proverbs chapter 8. They say, before anything was, I was there. And there's a feminine spirit speaking. I was there creating together. I was a master craftsman. I was the first that came about before anything was created. And the Holy Spirit was functioning. No, the Holy Spirit doesn't have shape and form. But the Holy Spirit was functioning in the feminine attributes of God. And so there was the Word and the Spirit and creation came about. The Word is the second person of the Godhead. The Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. And together, the masculine and the feminine aspects of God brought forth all creation. That harmonizes John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, with Proverbs chapter 8. Question answered. It is the Holy Spirit showing the feminine aspects of creation. Beautiful in its own way. That show for why in the human race today and in all the animal world, you need generally for higher animals, of course the low animals, uh, they got what we call, uh, you know, they, they, don't, they don't have any gender kind of thing. They, they auto-produce themselves. But in the higher animals, they're male and female. Because the physical points to a spiritual truth. The spiritual truth are higher. Because uh, that's the way God made it. So you actually have seven spirits that have the masculine and the feminine aspects. And all everything points to Christ. All true. Uh, like I mentioned, the seven levels of the revelation of Christ. Uh, in, in the square, that was that. A square of wisdom, square of peace, square of love. And uh, for example, uh, at the beginning here, square of wisdom uh, is revealed in male and female wisdom in Christ. Christ the wisdom of God. And then the square of peace is revealed in uh, Christ uh, the Word. And uh, then this is in the area of uh, the Holy Spirit uh, in Genesis. Uh, the two coming together. Then you have... Uh, Square of love, Jesus the bridegroom, the church as the bride. And then you have the square of glory, the right hand of God, the left hand of God. To do two things together. Then you have the square of power, the power of being and the power of doing. And then you have the square of life, masculine life, feminine life. Then you have the square of mercy. Truth and mercy united in God. Psalms 85 verse 10. Truth and mercy came to, together. And it says, uh, when uh, uh, righteousness and peace kiss each other. And the mercy of God are combined together. Praise God. Was there a question coming? No questions there. Okay. Now, in this chart, I also fill up the other blanks. And that is, what happens when wisdom and peace gets together? What happens when wisdom and love gets together? And that is repeated twice because it happens two times when you cross the chart this way. That's why I retain the same color. You can identify them by the similar colors. They are talking about the same thing. And so, like for example, when wisdom and peace gets together is protection. Philippians chapter 4. The peace of God garrison your heart and your mind. It's talking about a protective covering. And all revealing the works of the Holy Spirit in a 7 times 7 spirit. 7 times 7 spirit. And then when wisdom and love gets together, what happened? Fullness received. Like Ephesians chapter 3. Now tonight I'm not going to touch on all those things, but I just want to show you how this chart was formed. In Ephesians 3 it says, the width, the length, the breadth, 
the height of love that we may comprehend, that we may lay hold of. So that is the fullness received. When wisdom and love come together, that's when you can receive the fullness of God. Without, without wisdom coming together with love, you cannot receive the fullness of God. When wisdom combined with glory, Colossians chapter 1, you have fruitfulness. Fruitfulness. When wisdom combines with power, you have fullness perceived. Ephesians chapter 1. Remember, to know the hope of his calling, the inheritance in a sense, the exceeding greatness of his power towards us. Remember Ephesians 1, 18, 19. Spirit of wisdom and revelation establish the fullness of the power that we can know. Fullness perceived. So this chart should be available uh, from uh, Colin and uh, in his computer now. So you can have this chart uh, emailed to you and I think we can put this chart up with this, today's message on Genesis. But I just wanted to show you here how this is the part that we cover tonight. Just this spot. And how this spot points to everything else down the line in the combination of the seven times seven spirit, the masculine and the feminine sector that is there. Uh, this one is a whole teaching series in itself. And so one day we're going to teach on that area. Uh, that is there. But you can see uh, how it combines and the scriptures that, it, that, uh, that brings all these things together. Let me look at an interesting point. Like for example, when life and love together, which is here, and where's the same color? Here, it is the manifestation of faith, hope, and love. Say, so why do I put faith, hope, and love together? Because they're all together. Faith comes from hope. Faith is energized by love. Galatians 5 verse 6. The three forces are related when life and love come together. Then, uh, when life and peace get together, it's called Ephesians chapter 1 and 3, is the energizing that is there. But you will notice a lot of things. How a lot of power, like for example, Dunamis. Dunamis power is peace and power together. Uh, let's say peace and love together is discernment. And uh, let your love grow in discernment. And peace and glory together is exousia, authority. Peace and power together is dunamis. Peace and life together is the energizing. So these three forces actually related to peace too. Without peace, you cannot put the God, uh, the God of you can the God of peace cannot crush Satan under except the God of peace. And that is why when peace and mercy come together is the throne of the Lord, the God of peace that puts Satan under your feet. Uh, so mercy has a lot of it in throne. Mercy has throne room, throne of the Lord, God of love. Uh, there is mercy and love. Uh, throne of glory, God of light, throne of grace, truth and mercy. All together. So the seven spirits produce everything and all the colors of God's attributes and creation that we have to have. So today we understand that the reason why you have feminine wisdom, masculine wisdom, because everything else in creation and how creation exists is based on derivations of the seven times seven spirit together. We never saw the feminine and the masculine before, but you will find it in all the sacrifices. Sometimes some of the sacrifices require only female animal. Some sacrifices require male animal. So this chart can be tied also to that. And I did thought a series on that, uh, on, on these aspects. So that is to explain in summary in one chart how everything progresses from wisdom times wisdom and everything else came about. Because before God created anything, He must create the principles behind it. It's like the energy. 
that cause everything to exist. Everything exists based on the Word of God. And the Word of God got many doctrines, many derivations, many flows. And all of it flows from all the energizing of God. So that brings us back to this chart that we finally complete. To we added, oops, uh, okay, we can switch back to. Uh, thank you. Yes. So we we come back to here today to show forth that in the creation process we consider Genesis chapter one verse one, we consider John chapter one verse one, we consider Proverbs chapter eight. And uh, then we consider the work of the seven spirits of God. And we explain how all things flow from the seven times seven spirit. And so everything else became perfected. Which is why now we are here and uh, God wants to make everything perfect again. You need to join together back with the seven times seven spirit of God. Praise the Lord. Yes. 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 Originally, Mars, Jupiter, all those were very nice looking planets. What we see of the universe today, as far as the telescopes can go, are all part of the fallen world. We are not seen beyond the fallen world. The universe is that big. Oh, they represent. Yeah. In fact, uh, every single star that was made was a representation of a created being. Every star that was made. Every one of us got a star that represents us. So, there is a reason when God made the stars and put it out there. So, the creation of God is a beautiful story. So we tell this story in the most complete way possible from all aspects of the Bible. Praise God. Any final questions before we close tonight? Praise the Lord. Then we have a break next week. I'm in Australia. And then in two weeks time, we'll continue with a creation story two about Adam and Eve. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you, Father, that you continue to show forth all the goodness, the glory, the splendor of your creation. Let the glory of your creation be known. We live in a fallen world and our consciousness that we have retained is that of this fallen world. Grant that we may be like Jesus, that we may rediscover our predestination our destiny before we came, the mission why we came to the planet Earth, why we exist here on Earth, what we are here to be and to do. So Father, we ask that you establish each one of us as your creation. We recognize we may function like you, but we always remain a created being. So as created beings, we bow down and we worship you and acknowledge you our Lord and our Savior. We acknowledge, O oh God, that forever you will always be our Creator and the one whom we worship. The fall of that creation can never, ever replace the Creator. It is only because of your great joy and delight in us you create us to enjoy your creation to enjoy existence, to enjoy life. So Father, let a joy of life come into each one of us so that we will learn to be a part of your perfect creation and perfect recreation and one day into the new Jerusalem, the new recreation of the planet Earth where even the new heaven and the new earth will come forth. Thank you, Father, for all that you're doing. We give you all the praise, give you all the glory, give you all the worship. What can we say when we see what you have done except to God be the glory. Great things he has done. 
Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all rise together and sing praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Give Jesus a offering. God bless you. Amen.